Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Dr. Jenny Byrne. Dr. Jenny is a PhD in neurophysiology in the science of attention, and she's got 15 years as a psychiatrist and therapist. She's someone who loves working with healthcare organizations to innovate and disrupt. She's an Amazon bestseller with her book, Work Smart. Use your brain and behavior to master the future of work. Dr. Jenny, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Dr. Lara. It's great to be here. Now, before we get into our topic of the day, what's your fun fact? So my fun fact is that I am currently playing in a rock band. My pandemic new instrument is the electric bass. Nice. And I perform a couple times a year. I just had a show a couple weeks ago. What is your absolute most favorite song to just rock out to? Our first show was all about the 80s. I love the 80s. And we played Pat Benatar Heartbreaker, which was super fun. Oh, what fun. Yes, yeah, she's amazing. So you get, did you like do the 80s hair and the shoulder pads and all that? Or did you resist the temptation? I got my hair as high as it would go. And I did one of the classic 80s off the shoulder looks where you cut your t-shirt up. Nice. Nice. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm getting all sorts of uh, junior high, high school flashbacks <laughs> going on pictures, which by the way, none of you out there will ever <laughs> see. So get that idea right out of your head. There are certain, uh, certain eras in life that are great for nostalgia purposes and better left to the imagination when it comes to what you actually looked like and <laughs> thought looked good at the time. But that was such a fun era. So, all right. Why are we here today, everybody? The I have brought Dr. Jenny on because Look, for the last three years, we have all been Zooming day in and day out, both in our schedules overall, but also in the virtual world. It is the new normal. Whether it's hybrid or otherwise, we're virtual almost all day. And, you know, I have certainly talked plenty of times about different aspects of the virtual conferences, the video conferences, et cetera, the importance of microphones, the, you know, how to set yourself up right, method, methods of engagement in the virtual space, et cetera. We talked a little bit about what's going on in the brain at different points, but Dr. Jenny, as a neuroscientist, very specifically, is someone who can talk about the real brain science behind Zoom. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the neuroscience of Zoom, the neuroscience of virtual meetings, so that you can understand why you feel what you feel, why your brain does and doesn't focus and respond the way you want it to, why you maybe can and can't get other people to engage the way you want them to. And most important, we're going to look at not just what's happening in the brain when you're doing it right and what's happening in the brain when you're not doing it right, which for way too many of us is the rule rather than the exception. And of course, some practical do's and don'ts. Dr. Jenny, how does that sound to you today? That sounds great. One of my favorite topics. All right. So let's get into it. When when we're in the Zoom mode, and I'm using Zoom, of course, to reference any virtual platform, whether you're in Teams or WebEx or you know whatever it happens to be, it doesn't matter. But what's going on? And let's start with when you're doing it right, Let's let's define doing it right from a neurological perspective, and then we'll back into how do we get to that right? What's happening neurologically when we're zooming right? So when we are zooming right, there's a key concept as it relates to brain activity between human beings, because we're all human beings. Unless you're chatting with robots on Zoom, you're probably doing it with human beings, maybe some dogs or cats sometimes, but... <laughs> Basically, the idea to take away is the idea of synchrony. So synchrony is a term you may think about music, people, or synchronized swimming or things. Synchrony basically means that things are happening together, typically in a pattern, which is often an oscillating pattern, meaning kind of it has ups and downs the way music does. So this concept of synchrony is really important because when you are doing a good job at Zoom, you are synchronously at the same time interacting with other humans. In your brain, if you do it right, 
your brain will actually synchronize with the other people on the call. So if I could put you in a MRI scanner and look at the functional activity of your brain, if you and somebody on a Zoom call are in sync with one another, your brains will actually start to do the same thing. And there's some fast, yeah, there's some fascinating studies, not from Zoom, but from other settings where, for example, um, an actor on the stage may drop something on the floor. And if you were to image the person watching that, if they are in sync with the play, their brain reacts as if they dropped something on the floor. Mm. So your brain actually synchronizes to other people. So when you're doing it right, all of the neurophysiology in your brain that's designed to sync with other people happens. And when you are in sync with other people, it feels wonderful. Yes. I think everybody can relate to that, whether it's in person or on Zoom. Being in sync with other human beings is a feeling of connectedness. And when it happens, it's beautiful. And I, I think most everybody has experienced it at least a couple times in their lives. But when you truly feel in sync with somebody, your body responds and releases hormones. So for example, oxytocin. When you're in sync with other human beings, oxytocin is released and that's a bonding neurochemical if you kind of want to overgeneralize it. Sure. So the brain syncs up and then it helps the body react by releasing oxytocin. So the brain body is really connect. So it is really important. So when you are doing Zoom right, first of all, your brain is syncing up with other people. And then that's triggering neurochemicals in the rest of your body, which feel just wonderful. So if I'm if I'm hearing this correctly, that the the definition of synchrony, so to speak, is that feeling of connection with other people. And I think we've all had those those conversations virtually in person or anywhere else where we feel like there's chemistry here that we're yeah. in the zone that we, they just got me. I got them. We got each other. It, there was just good flowing energy. We got lots of stuff done. We were all on the same page, pick whatever metaphor you like. I just threw like four of them in there and <laughs> whatever modality, like pages or waves or something along those lines. Um, and that, that feels good. That feels that's energizing because it feels comfortable. Like we're you always feel more comfortable when you're with someone who's like you and we're, we're so being in sync when you're doing zoom, right. will allow you to get into that mode. Is that accurate? Yes. And it's literally synchrony of electrical activity in your brain and in our bodies. So again, it's the brain body connection. And you probably have heard from a long time ago, women, for example, who live together, often will synchronize menstrual cycles together. Like our bodies are designed to sync with other human beings. So, so that's not a myth. That is actually a fact that uh, actually women true. Will together will eventually sync. And it's not just about, because some people are 28 days, some people are 31 days and eventually everything aligns. No, if, if they are in sync, I mean, not living together doesn't necessarily mean you're in sync with somebody, but if, mm -hmm. if they are living together truly in sync, that will tend to happen. And you see other other patterns of that as well, but that's kind of the most commonly known one. Huh. Okay. So there's, it's, so let's put that in the context of Zoom. What are some things that people do to get into that good Zoom synchrony? So when I talk about Zoom calls, and I know you do this as well, one of the things I encourage people to think about is the idea that a Zoom call is a synchronous communication, the same way that if you were in a room together, it would be synchronous, right? Same time. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that I do and others can do to improve that synchrony is to make use of a couple neuroscience concepts. Okay. So first one is mirror cells. So our brains have neurons. So neurons are the building block of our brain, right? Those little cells. And certain neurons are mirror cells. They are designed to mirror. mirror like you look at your itself in the mirror on yep. your wall. Okay, mirror, exactly. M -R -O -R. Got it, mirror cells. And they are designed to mirror other human beings. So for example, if you can imagine, animals have mirror cells too. If I watch, if I, if I watch you opening 
a very complicated jar that I've never opened before. I can watch you and I can mirror your behavior and then I can open that jar. So mirror cells are there to connect you with what the other person is doing. Now for Zoom, what that means is when you're on Zoom, when I'm on Zoom, what happens to mirror cells? You're looking at 20 faces sometimes, right? Or yes. you have your own self view on. If you have your own self view on, you're mirroring yourself and it's flipped. The left right axis is flipped. So it's very confusing to the brain to see 20 faces and then your own face down in the corner. So best practice on Zoom, for example, would be to use the mirror cells in a way that's more natural. How so that, that means turn on speaker view, turn off Hollywood squares, <laughs> turn on speaker view. And the biggest one, turn off your self view. You know, maybe mm. turn on your self view for a couple minutes to make sure you don't have food in your teeth or your hair, you know, sure. make sure everything looks kind of normal, but then turn it off. So by helping the mirror cells um, connect in a more natural way to the other human beings on the screen, you make it a lot easier on your brain. It feels less distressed and you're able to actually mirror. So another tip around mirroring would be if somebody is, if you're presenting during a meeting and there's somebody that you want to engage with, or maybe you're just one-on-one -on, -one on a Zoom. And they do something like with their hand, you know, they touch their jaw and they go like this. If you mirror that behavior, it will create a sense of synchronization with the other person. And this works in person too, by the way. If right. somebody crosses their legs, you cross their legs. So you can enhance the natural mirroring effect to help create this bond. And sometimes that's very subtle, but very effective. So mirror cells are a big one. No, we got to be careful. Of course, we're not encouraging you. And I just want to make sure there's clarity out there for everybody that uh, Dr. Jenny, we're not saying do monkey see monkey do. You're not trying to mimic the other person because after a while, they're going to look at you and go, what are you doing? That's that. That's not the extent, the extreme to which we're suggesting this, but just little details here and there, resting your hand on your chin or your, your chin on your hand or uh, leaning back in the chair versus leaning forward to show interest versus relaxing, et cetera. These are certain ways that when done subtly can subconsciously inspire that sense of, of similarity. He's like me. Great clarification. Yes. Do not pretend that you're a mirror and doing the monkey of the other person that will not work, but yes, yes, absolutely. So mirror cells are one. The other one is um, cells in the brain that are called face cells. So we have, and animals have this too, we have neurons in our brain that are specifically designed to recognize faces. And moreover, we look at certain parts of human faces. We look typically at the eyes. And if we see two human faces, we look between the eyes so that we can understand the relationship between the two people. And so again, if you have Hollywood squares on, and your face cells in your brain are seeing all these faces coming at you from all these different angles and nobody's looking at each other, it's very distressing to your brain. So again, going off the Hollywood squares. And by Hollywood squares, just for anybody who doesn't know the reference, we're talking about uh, in gallery mode, right? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm being, <laughs> I'm like dating myself here. Yes, yes, exactly. I was the totally with you. Mode. I understood oh <laughs> well exactly what you meant. I'll also call that Brady Bunch mode. So yes. Which yeah, is so the same era at that point. So we're just dating ourselves further, but oh, well, already under the bus, continue. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so exactly. So, so figuring a way to make the facial recognition as natural as possible um, is another way to help get in synchrony with the people on the call. Um, and then the third thing I would say is, remember, we talked about the brain body connection. Your body responds to the Zoom screen the way your brain responds. So your body, if you are very close to a monitor or a screen of some kind, your brain will trick you and make you think that you are actually in that little box and your body language will become very, very stiff. And then the other people on the Zoom will also start to get stiff and you'll creep up closer and closer and closer to your monitor and you'll get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. So a best practice I use is what I'm doing right now, and I have to remind myself of this all the time, by the way, 
is to get at least an arm's length away from your screen. And then my brain no longer thinks I'm stuck in this little box. And then my body language will relax. And you'll see more of my shoulders and my head. And you won't just see my head close up, which is actually pretty unnatural. We don't normally get you know, four inches away from someone's face while we're speaking to them. So all of these things can also connect your body and brain and make it feel more natural and more in sync. So if, if I'm understanding correctly and you're putting different, uh, you're putting the labels on what I have um, otherwise taught, but without the, the, the vocabulary necessarily from your depth, that a big part of what I've always encouraged people to do is to try to figure out how to make the virtual space reflect the the qualities of being in person. So to your point with regard to distance, I try to encourage people to go from at least kind of armpits or mid torso yep. on up because one of the things that I find most people when I'm coaching, um, one of the things people complain about most about the virtual space is feeling like I can't read the audience. I, I can't, I'm not, I don't get any feedback from them. Of course, if they have their cameras off, you'll get nothing. But even if cameras are on, when you're zoomed in and all you have is this giant face staring at you, very kind of Brady Bunch style, that at least Hollywood Squares had, like you could actually see the the person's torso. <laughs> but the um, when you, all you see, it's like, can you imagine going into the conference room or meeting someone at Starbucks and just seeing their head sitting on the table? That would be a little strange, but when you push back and you can see more of their body language, you can see when they lean to the side, you can see when they do a hand gesture, when they shrug their shoulders or when their head kind of cocks to the, on an angle, a little quizzically, you're, you, so to be able to show them more of your body language, more that sort of that mid torso on upward, you're actually doing an act of generosity in that you are communicating more openly, more comprehensively with them. You're allowing them to read you more, which I would, I'm going to now use your term, is creating greater synchrony with right. that person. And am, am, am I on track with this? Yes. And you'll notice that your body language will change if you sit back. You'll mm -hmm. notice that you are less stiff and you do move more naturally and you will convey more information to the other person. I love the way you said that. It's a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift to someone to give them that. I think people don't think about it that way. And, and I really want to encourage everyone to, because when you think about being the speaker you'd want to talk to, what is it that you, makes you feel least comfortable when you're presenting? Okay, well, turn that around. If, you, right. if, if we know that I can't stand when I can't read the other person's body language, well, they probably feel the same about yours. So, okay lead by example. Let's push back a little bit, get a little more distance. Like you mentioned, at least arm's length between the camera. It's a great, uh, easy yardstick, almost literally, as it were. You stick your hand out. And if you're actually making physical contact with your screen, back up. I don't know about, I mean, you can't see it uh, for those of you who are listening by the audio only, but <laughs> my cameras are a little further back and I've got a peripheral keyboard here and which are now everywhere. So I can put the keyboard at a place, if you're on a laptop, that is uh, the peripheral keyboard allows you to have that distance, be more generous. It helps people to feel more comfortable with you in that. I love that word synchron synchrony. I want to, I want to be using that all the time now. So thank you for that piece. Um, okay. So let's see, let's, let's shift gears a little bit now, aside from just yeah. not doing the opposite of everything that we just described, what are some things, what's happening in the brain when we're doing zoom wrong? What does that look like? So when you're doing Zoom wrong, I would give the analogy, let's imagine that, you know, before humans had houses and electricity and Zoom and everything, you know, you're an animal and you are in the jungle. Imagine that you had 20 lions peeking out of the forest at you a foot away from your face. That's the amount of distress that your brain is going into when you're looking at gallery mode up close and having that intense eye contact where no one's looking at each other, it literally is putting your brain into high alert. Interesting. So it, it's creating a stress response. So there's two kinds of stress responses in the body. There is a short term kind of stress response, which is adrenaline, which mm -hmm. most people have heard of fight or flight response, right? The animals in the jungle, the lion jumps at you. It's a good chemical. It's there to protect you. 
but you don't need to be protected from a Zoom call. Like you shouldn't, well, maybe you do, but you shouldn't need to be. You will get eaten alive by it. <laughs> Probably not. on a literal not. level, at least. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's no reason for that danger alert system to be triggered every time you turn on a Zoom call. So, so that's the short term. Long term, so if you do Zoom a lot, a lot of people are doing Zoom, you know, all day, part of the day, most days. You actually can use Zoom most days, I think, and do a really good job of it. But if you're doing a bad job of it over and over and over again, day after day after day, now that short-term stress response is getting transformed into a hormonal shift Mm. with cortisol. So cortisol is the long-term stress hormone. And cortisol, again, it's there to protect you. But if it's activated chronically, it wear and tears on your internal organs. And that's when you start to have stress-related illnesses, your stomach tends to go haywire, um, your immune system is depressed, you get, you sometimes can have mental illness problems. Like if you keep that cortisol rolling long enough, it will really wear down your body. So when you do Zoom wrong, it has this short-term consequence of Zoom fatigue, right? Where you're like at the end of the day, like I'm so tired. And there's actually research on that. That's a real thing mm. because your, your brain is just on alert mode. And then there's the long-term effects. If you keep doing it day in and day out, it will actually really hurt your body. So I would love to dig into that term a little bit more, the Zoom fatigue, because I think everyone has heard the term or just about everybody has heard the term. I think people very uh, typically overgeneralize it to just being a general sense of being sick of being on camera all the time. You, they're stuck in your chair. You never get to get up and move. There's the permanent butt divot from never, always being in that same seat. I mean, I don't know about you. I'm on Zoom so much that I'm sick of my own face by the end of the day, which of course I can always turn off uh, my my self mode right. as necessary. Um, but you know, one of the things that I've been constantly harping on is the importance of good sound because when to me, I feel like when I'm listening to most people on video conferences, they're using either what's embedded in their my, in their computer or they're using earbuds of some sort and AirPods for as expensive as they are, have lousy microphones. Steve Jobs and I, we're going to have, have a conversation one of these days in, in the next life. Talk to God first, those questions, right. and Steve Jobs, right. he's number two. And uh, you know why are there such lousy microphones on <laughs> AirPods? But I digress. But I find when I'm listening to somebody who sounds like this, like they're in a tin can or it's in a fog or in a cave, that I'm like leaning in and I'm squinting and I have to concentrate to just yep. make out what the words are. So there's this heightened level of concentration and of, of mental focus, this cognitive burden that is layered on. And when you have to sustain that heightened level of concentration for two, four, eight hours a day from meeting to meeting, that has to be cognitively draining, much less physically and emotionally. I think all those pieces are are interwoven for those of you who are not on uh, on watching this on the YouTube video, Dr. Jenny's nodding her head very slowly <laughs> yes. and very deliberately. So, uh, is, so help me out here. Can you, can you speak to this? Am I crazy on that? Or am I, is there good vocabulary we can put into what we've just, what I've just been describing? Yeah, I think you're, you're totally right. I think you highlight a very interesting aspect, which actually I haven't thought about as much. So I'm glad that you brought that up, which is the auditory sense so we have senses, right? We have all these senses. We have sight, smell, hearing, touch. Um, what am I missing? So taste. there you go, taste. So basically your brain is using up reserves, is using glucose, is using sugar for all of these things. So when you put strain or stress on any or all of those modalities, your brain takes way more glucose and way more energy to process. So like you said, if the sound quality is bad or scratchy, you're straining, right? You're using extra resources to hear. If the face, like I said, the face cells, if you're looking at all these faces, that's using up way more glucose. If you're um, looking at yourself in that self view the whole time, you're using up more resources. If your uh, desk setup is not good. If you're too close and you're all tight in your body, you're you. So all of your senses are involved. And so anything you can do to reduce the strain on your senses and your brain will help you be less fatigued. But there's a, 
technical term for this. The technical term is not Zoom fatigue. Mm -hmm. It's virtual uh, video conferencing fatigue. So they, in the research, they call it VC fatigue, but they've done some research on it. And what's really interesting is that um, VC fatigue was found to be worse for women and for other underrepresented groups. And the, and the thinking is that in the traditional workspace, which is what I call the you know nine to five physical office, women and other underrepresented groups feel like they have a much higher level of scrutiny than other people. And that has actually translated into Zoom. So women feel more visually scrutinized on Zoom the same way that they would uh, in the physical office. Now, perhaps it's only from the waist up, but you still have that sense of being scrutinized. So uh, women and other underrepresented groups tend to report more uh, VC fatigue than others, which I thought is super interesting. It is. And it, it's interesting because I've also read that in some, and again, these are not generalizations, but just uh, in whatever context the, the study was done, that some people have found that the gallery mode or Hollywood squares, et cetera, allows for a, almost a greater equalization that there's less comfort going yeah. back because everybody's exactly the same size. Everybody's got the right. same, you know, there's, there's no hierarchy as far as who sits where it's whoever joins that's where zoom or teams or whatever puts you. So there's something of, of a great equalizer yes. in this space that removes that, that pressure. So tell me about that. Definitely true. So one of the plus, I think one of the pluses of doing virtual work is all of the, what I would call physical artifacts of the traditional office power structure are upended. Okay. Right. So there's no top floor corner office with the windows for the boss. There's no executive bathroom. There's no who sits at the head of the conference room table. There's no, you know, um, who has the nicest desk, who has a secretary, who like all of these traditional artifacts are gone. Yes. So one of the nice things is that virtual and hybrid work has the potential to actually be quite equalizing. If again, like you said, if done right. Yes. Yeah. And it's it, even little things like, um, positioning in the camera, you know, nobody can tell how tall you are, how, how short you are. And, uh, you know, I, I I'm five foot nothing, but people who know me here, I've got a big voice. I you know, have learned how to angle my camera, et cetera. And there are many people who only know me in this virtual space. And then they meet me in person and they just look down like, wait, what are you doing down there? Wait, where, where'd you go? And it's like, nope, this is me. Hi, surprise. And it, yeah, I'm a good foot plus shorter than most other people who are out there. I had to laugh because one of my earlier guests, uh, Marcus Allen was the president, the president of the, um, of Big Brothers Big Sisters Independence chapter here in Philadelphia, and he was a basketball player. He's six 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 seven, yeah, yeah, six eight, something along those lines. But here on Zoom, I looked about an inch taller than You're him, and I was going to milk that for <laughs> everything it was worth. Yeah, of course, I'd probably come up to his belly button if it, we had to actually stand next to each other. But there's that equalization again. We look like equals here in the space, and that that gets taken away back in the in the vert when we go back to the in person modes. Um, so what's, what's give it, let's, let's wrap this up with a couple of minutes of really good tactical, like top five best practices, what to do when, so that we get the best engagement and we feel the best at the end of the meeting and at the end of the day when we're packed with zoom or any, of course we're using zoom fatigue, but I think zoom fatigue versus VC fatigue is kind of like saying, you know, Q-tip versus cotton swab. Yeah. It's just the, you know, using the the brand's name to reference the generic, so to speak. So, so we have a whole day or even a single hour worth of virtual meetings with people, virtual conversations, yep. Yep. how to minimize the Zoom slash VC fatigue and feel great about the experience. So we mentioned a couple already. So first of all, turn off your self view as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Stop doing gallery view. Maybe again, maybe the beginning, the first couple minutes, come on gallery, say hi to everybody, look at yourself, make sure your teeth are okay, whatever. And then turn off gallery, go to speaker view, sit more than an arm's length away. I think your call out around having the right equipment to minimize strain for the other person. Again, it's a gift 
to the other person to make it easier to hear and see you. And then a couple of things we didn't mention were um, breakout rooms. Hmm. It's a great way to engage, put people in smaller groups, make them go in and out, gives them something to do. They have to take an action that helps to engage. If something that you mentioned, Dr. Lara, if you're not comfortable on video or Zoom, I mean, you and I, I don't know, I feel like this has become quite natural, but 10 years ago, the first time I did it, I thought it was horrible. So practicing, I mean, it is a performance at the end of the day, especially when you're presenting uh, slides or to other people, you're, you're performing. And I would argue in person, you're performing as well. It's not exclusive to Zoom. So practice, you have to practice. And if you're uncomfortable, you know, get a buddy to help you practice, video yourself, practice with stuffed animals if you have to, you know, practice and practice and practice. I guarantee it gets easier. I, it what? did for me. I know it does for other people too. You really just have to do it. There, I mean, before the world went virtual, all virtual all the time, I was doing a lot of coaching with clients, uh, usually Skype at the time was, was my vehicle of choice when there was somebody who was remote. And it was always interesting to see where, for those who were local, who were like, no, 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 I need you to come to my office or I need to go meet you at your place, but I can't do virtual. And then mm -hmm. something inevitably would make it where logistically it wasn't possible to meet on a day they wanted to meet. And hemming and hawing, they would go and agree to try the virtual once. And inevitably by the end of that session, they'd go, oh, that was fine. I got the exact same value out of it. I'm like, I know, because there's nothing I can't say to you in person that I can't say to you in it's the same intellectual information exchange here. But we do have mental blocks against those kinds of things. But practice absolutely makes perfect. So yes, 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 record. Um, I love, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned using stuffed animals. And I, I'm <laughs> guessing there's a lot of people out there who would have laughed that off thinking you were being facetious. You're not. No, this is I'm a legitimate not. suggestion. Yeah. So one thing we teach patients in therapy, sometimes, especially with anxiety disorders, you know, we teach something called exposure therapy, which is basically you work your way up to your fear. So for people who are fear of flying, you would start with sit in your room and imagine an airplane for five minutes. Next week, you're going to imagine sitting on the airplane for 10 minutes. The next week, you're going to drive to the airport and drive home, you know, and you kind of go through mm. these steps. Similar with video work your way up. I'm not kidding when I say stuffed animals. If you don't have a friend that you trust or a family member or a kid or someone, get literally get stuffed. I have a friend who who practiced uh, piano this way. She's very shy. She had to start practicing in front of stuffed animals as a grown adult. Um, whatever, you really have to practice and it will become more comfortable. And one thing that I have, a, a, a hack that I've often shared with people to help them get used to uh, being on video, especially when they perhaps don't see somebody else, even if they're trying to record something that will be used asynchronously later. So there's yeah. literally no audience in the moment they're talking is to um, either get a photograph of your family, somebody who makes you smile a time when you were smiling, or even go to Google images and just yeah. print out a, like type in happy audience and get a bunch of people smiling and clapping and just print out a little copy of that and tape it right next to you or underneath your camera, because then at least you see people smiling at you. And even though you know they're not actually there and you know they didn't hear a word you said, your those mirror neurons that you're describing yeah. will react in such a way. And you're kind of feeding them this, this deliberate mental diet of happy thoughts that make you re on reflex smile back and kind of help you to open up huh. a little bit. Am I crazy? Or is that? Uh, no, am, I've am never I... heard that hack, but I really love it. I think I'm going to steal it. <laughs> okay. I feel honored. Dr. Jay, the neurologist <laughs> is stealing one of my hacks. Great. Okay. So everybody out there, if you're someone who has heard me give that hat, <laughs> I'm not crazy. I'm not trying to send you down the wrong path. You heard it here first. It's valid. It's a winner. So try it. What do you have to lose? Nothing. That's the beauty of all of this. Any final tips, Dr. Jenny? Uh, final tips is just, I think virtual hybrid is here to stay. I think I believe the pros outweigh the cons. I think uh, we're just at the beginning of figuring out how to make it all work, but there are people who are making it work. And so I'm very optimistic for the future. I think that you mentioned some equalizing that could happen with virtual hybrid work. 
Some people want to go back in an office all day long. Great. Some companies will do that. Some companies never want to be together. Great. But I think about 70% of us want some combination of the two. So I'm a futurist. I'm an optimist. I'm very optimistic for what the future holds. I think we're seeing a real shift in how we work. Absolutely. And see, the more people follow the the tips that you've given us today, the more likely they're going to be successful. So everybody just go back, take some notes on this, try stuff. There's nothing to lose. And boy, it's amazing. And something I've said from day one, small changes make big differences. Doesn't have to be expensive. Doesn't have to be time consuming. Little things make big differences. So try everything. It's going to help. So Dr. Jenny, I have loved this conversation. Is there anything you'd like to give our audience today? Uh, Yes, I would. So you mentioned that I'm an author. My book came out recently. I'd love to give you all a special promo code. So if you want to get uh, um, signed copies of the book or book clubs or things like that, you can go to my website and I'll give you a promo code. So the website is wwwwork smart-book.com. And for you all, the promo code is Dr. Laura 20, and that'll give you 20% off um, any of the book packages there. So I'd love to offer that to your, to your folks. Oh, thank you so much. And of course we will put the link and the promo code in the, uh, in the show notes. So if you're driving or on a bicycle or something right now, of course, no need to, to pull over, but do come back and get those links. And just to clarify that doctor is Dr. Laura 20 or D O C T O R. So people know what that is. Yeah. D R L A U R A 20. Perfect. Perfect. This has been lovely. Thank you for validating so much of what we've been <laughs> trying to help people do and the, all of our methods. And now everybody's got the science behind the magic. So, Dr. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I love your energy. I feel like we got a little synchrony going today. I think we got a lot of synchrony and I loved every minute of it. So, everybody else, if you want to check that out, once you've done listening on the uh, on Apple Podcast or Spotify or whatever podcast or whatever platform you're listening to, go back and check the video as well. Because of course we do have this on YouTube and you can see for yourself. Everybody out there, thank you for tuning in as always. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice so we can help even more people to increase their confidence, presence, and influence. Finally, of course, if you want to download my free guide to equipment recommendations like those microphones we referenced to minimize that Zoom slash VC fatigue and lights and all those other fun things, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for readers who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.